Hi everyone, um, welcome to our CTLT 2023 Spring Institute session titled, How do instructors design experiential education um, activities in large first year classes in the Faculty of Arts? My name is Naomi Hudson and I'm an undergraduate research assistant at the UBC Office for Regional and International Community Engagement. Um, I'm joined here by my fellow research assistants, um, Asiem Jashkabai and Valeria Perez, as well as our panelists, Drs. Neil Armitage, Catherine Lyon, Chiang Wang, and Brian Orr Alvarez. Thank you so much for all of you for joining us here this afternoon. Um, before I continue, I just wanted to take a moment to acknowledge the lands upon which we're gathered. While we may be located all throughout the province, country, or the world, I'd like to acknowledge that UBC Vancouver is located on the traditional, ancestral, and unceded territories of the Musqueam, Squamish, and Tsleil-Waututh peoples. And as we proceed through this session on experiential education, um, we encourage you to think about the ways in which you can challenge Eurocentric and hierarchical theories of education and promote and encourage more emancipatory ways of learning that promote truth and reconciliation. Um, we encourage you to learn more about the in Indigenous lands upon which you live, work, and play. So as previously stated, this session is on experiential education, um, specifically in large first year classes. It'll be an interactive session where we present research and personal insights into what experiential education looks like or can look like at UBC. And we hope that at the end of our hour and a half together, um, you'll leave feeling more confident in your ability to design and implement experiential education into your courses. We'll begin with a session um, We'll, um, we'll begin our session with a brief presentation from the ORIS research assistants on some of the research that we've conducted over the past year and a half on experiential education in large first year classes. And after that, we'll hear from each of our four panelists on their experiences with experiential education. And finally, we'll end the session um, with time per permitting, obviously, with some um, breakout rooms where we invite participants to discuss some of their key takeaways from this session. Um, if you have any questions um, throughout the session, please feel free to raise your hand or ask them in the chat and we'll be more than happy to answer them. Um, if there are any questions before we get going and if not, we can just jump straight into our, um, our presentation. Okay, so um, without further ado, I'm very excited to introduce the first year experiential education or FYEE project from UBC ORIS. So in this presentation, the ORIS research assistants will be sharing some key findings from the research that we've done on how to minimize faculty barriers to experiential learning in large first year arts courses. So just for a brief over, overview of what's to come in this specific presentation, we'll begin with the quick introduction of the FYEE project itself and the team behind it. Then we'll introduce you to some in, to existing information on this topic. From there, we'll delve into our preliminary findings and we'll end our presentation with some recommendations on how to improve the state of experiential education at UBC. To dive a little bit deeper into the project, uh, the general purpose of our research is to identify challenges and facilitators in the application of experiential education in first year large classes, specifically in the Faculty of Arts and to eventually develop resources to help promote experiential education around the faculty, again, focusing on first year and large classes. Our study populations comprised of instructors and students in the Faculty of Arts across various departments, and we aim to answer the following research questions. How can first year better prepare and scaffold students for second and fourth year or upper year EE courses? What prevents instructors from implementing EE in large first year courses? And finally, what makes it possible to do EE in large first year classes and what it motivates instructors to do so? To introduce the first year experiential education team, uh, we have our supervisors going left to right, which include Tamara Baldwin, the director of the Office of Regional and International Community Engagement, Dr. Neil Armitage, a lecturer in the Department of Sociology, Dr. Catherine Lyon, uh, an assistant professor of teaching in the Department of Sociology. And finally, Dr. Siobhan McBee, an associate professor of teaching in the Department of Geography. At the bottom, we have our research assistants, including myself, uh, Assam Jacques Sabai, Naomi Hudson, and Valeria Perez.
Now to dive a little bit deeper into the project, uh, our literature review established the connection between experiential education and its uses in large first year courses, specifically by discussing the foundational theory behind experiential education, the outcomes for students and instructors, the benefits and drawbacks of implementing it and the motivations behind it. For the purposes of our research and the scope of this project, a large class was defined as more than 50 students or even greater than 100 students, as is most common in large research universities such as UBC. And experiential education, or EE, uh, was defined as a learning philosophy that is based on the premise that certain knowledge can be acquired more effectively through experience rather than didactic classroom content. Uh, we found that existing literature tends to emphasize experiential education as a successful learning strategy, specifically for upper year smaller classes. Uh, despite the well-documented benefits of experiential education across all educational levels. And so our literature review identified an opportunity for the development of better support systems for faculty and students. So um, this led to this research project and our research data included input on experiential education at UBC from both instructors and students with an emphasis on the former. Uh, we interviewed 13 professors, all of whom had experience in experiential education and arts classes. And while not all of them um, implemented EE in first year, all, all of them had experience with EE in large classes overall. Additionally, we conducted a focus group with approximately 30 upper year sociology students on their views and experiences of EE at UBC to gain a better understanding of EE and the experiences from the student side. All interviews and focus groups were qualitatively coded and formed the basis for preliminary uh, findings and recommendations that you will see later on in this presentation. Okay, so here we have an overview of some of our key findings. We'll be addressing some of these more in depth later on in the presentation, but for now, here's a summary of what we found through our data collection process. Firstly, we found that most instructors understand experiential education as community engaged and specifically in first year as bite-sized learning, which we'll delve into later on. Um, secondly, we learned that um, experiential education has many pedagogical benefits, um, including helping students develop both hard and soft skills that they can use throughout the rest of their degrees and in the future, um, in, in their future careers. Thirdly, we found that um, experiential education in lower years, so i.e. first or even going into second year, can help set the foundation for EE in third or fourth years and beyond. Fourthly, we found that institutional and equity re related barriers are hindrances to the implementation and design of EE. And finally, we concluded that a strong network of support is needed for the successful implementation and design of experiential education. So what does EE look like in first year? Most of the activities described by instructors who conduct experiential education in first year courses at UBC were primarily strategy specific or community engaged activities. Uh, strategy specific activities in this case or in this context refer to short term bite sized versions of larger projects that aim to develop specific skills such as reflection, critical thinking, technical skills and so on and they acted as both an introduction to the university as a whole and experiential education. Examples of experiential education described by instructors excluded more extensive projects that required deeper engagement, more time commitment and higher skill levels. So for example, it excluded um, very extensive international experiences or more direct involvement with community partners, which were more prevalent in the upper year EE examples. Uh, instructors in our study therefore strategically chose uh, experiential activities that they deemed appropriate for first year students in order to build the foundation for their learning experiences later on. So we are asking ourselves why EE in first year classes? So with our study, we found that EE in first year in the Faculty of Art was often seen as a a stepping stone to larger, more immersive and substantial EE opportunities in upper year courses. And the rationale being that first year students may not have the capacity to handle more substantive EE experiences when they first join university. So 
exposing students to experiential education as early as possible can help them build the strong foundations necessary to take full advantage of the more extensive hands-on educational opportunities that they may encounter in open years of their undergraduate degrees where most of EE experiences are found. So this foundational uh, buildup can be seen through three of the benefits that EE has in first year students in the long run. Uh, first being uh, that EE is highly effective introduction to students' discipline uh, of choice. Uh, second being EE teaches students skills and knowledge that will be more easily retained uh, through their, throughout their course uh, of their degree. And third, EE helps students build um, an early strong sense of identity as members of the wider academic community. So when analyzing our instructor interviews, we found that barriers to experiential education can be divided into two broad categories, institutional or school related barriers and equity barriers. So starting with institutional barriers, then those can be split into two subcategories, access to resources and class structures. So let's start with class structures. We identified three main class structure related barriers, time constraints, assessments, and class sizes. I'll focus on the first two since we'll delve more into class sizes um, later on once we, once we talk about resources. So with regards to time constraints, many professors felt like the um, traditional three credit semester long course structure doesn't really give students or instructors enough time to fully benefit from all that EE has to offer. Rather, they suggest that six credit year long courses um, often found in, um, in certain programs like the coordinated arts program would be more conducive to EE classes. Assessments were another concern and a primary source of stress for instructors and students alike. Students may find that they're not willing to take EE classes due to anxieties about the class affecting their averages and they would rather stick with the familiarity of the traditional lecture style um, learning. And professors may find it difficult to apply um, quote unquote traditional forms of assessment to experiential education especially when students input their own views and experiences into their classwork, which can be pretty common in EE. I mean, after all, how does one assign a grade to a student's own personal experience? And so moving on to um, types of resources, um, there are two main types of resources that professors indicated that they lacked adequate access to, human and financial. So with regards to human resources, in this case, this largely referred to TA and academic assistance support especially in large first year classes that often have hundreds of, of students. With regards to financial resources, some professors express that there is a lack of sustainable funding for EE opportunities. And they also said that the temporary nature of grant funding can be a large, a large cause of stress for instructors who are seeking to maybe um, introduce more um, immersive or cost intensive opportunities to their students. Um, in addition, instructors are very rarely rewarded monetarily for implementing EE, and these barriers disproportionately affect marginalized scholars, so academics of color, women, queer academics, etc., who are more likely to take on these opportunities in the first place. Which brings us to our second barrier, equity. Again, we divided this barrier into two subcategories, instructor barriers and student barriers. And since we already touched a bit on instructor equity barriers, let's expand upon that first. So like we stated before, marginalized professors are often the ones that take on most of the burden of the design and implementation of EE. Um, these instructors are also less likely to be tenured or tenure track, which means that, the heavy, that, means that, that they have heavier course loads than their white, straight, male, or cis counterparts, resulting in an even higher burden being placed upon them. And so if we shift the focus over to, to students, we'll see that, that there's a lot of overlap in the equity barriers facing both students and professors, um, specifically identity related barriers like what we um, just discussed earlier, but also accessibility barriers, financial barriers for students who can't afford the more cost intensive opportunities, as well as students that have responsibilities outside of school being affected by the time constraints that are often associated with EE. So in response to the challenges, we have grouped the facilitators that are or could motivate and support instructors in design, development, and execution of experiential education 
in first year large classes. So similar to our challenges, these groups, which are really summarized for this presentation, correspond to first uh, institutional facilitators, which this time explains how existing or possible uh, class structure, resources, and organizations uh, within EBC have been uh, helpful so far to implement EE. Uh, second, we have equity facilitators, which this time focuses more on professors' desire for UBC Vancouver to recognize the immense labor of both uh, faculty and students that often goes into the implementation of experiential education. And third, uh, we have an extra social component, which talks about the need of creating uh, spaces for instructors to get to know what other instructors are doing, share resources, and find support within each other instead of implementing EE in isolation. So we have joined these three groups into what Mantine Hubber referred to in their 2021 article as the village which explains how educational designers, administrators, teaching assistants, and technologies create this digital village community to successfully um, incorporate the sociological and ecological aspects of EE. And so we'll conclude our presentation with a list of recommendations on how to improve the state of EE at UBC. And these recommendations are largely based on the barriers and facilitators um, identified by students and instructors in our research collection process. So firstly, there is clearly um, a need for more access to human resources for instructors like TA and AAA support. And these positions, because they're often occupied by students, can also serve as sort of a, a de facto form of experiential education in and of themselves. So you're kind of killing two birds with one stone in that regard. Um, we also advocate for more access for networking opportunities for instructors, and, that's, and this can manifest in a variety of forms, including conferences, fellowships, mixers, and much more. Um, we'd also recommend the creation and distribution of peer-reviewed resources on assessment to help professors navigate how to assess EE in, in, in a learning environment that doesn't always make it super clear how to do that. Additionally, we would recommend the, de the development of resources on course design, including on how to incorporate um, equity, diversity, and inclusion in EE course content. And finally, on the instructor side, more institutional recognition for professors that implement EE is also necessary. And we also have some recommendations um, specifically on how to increase student engagement in EE. This includes more low to no cost opportunities for students who may not be able to afford the more costly opportunities such as Go Global, um, more year long six credit EE courses so that students with responsibilities outside of school such as work or commuting are not so pressed for time, as well as more research into student and TA perspectives on EE. While we were able to engage students with our focus group and we found that research to be um, incredibly valuable to forming our, our findings. This project was still largely focused on the instructor's pers perspective. And so we feel like in the future, having a project that's maybe focused on the student and TA perspective can help us gain a fuller understanding of the benefits of EE and how to really take full advantage of them going forward. So as we get to the end of the presentation, uh, we would like to jump right to introducing our panelists. So if you have any questions about any of the information shared in our presentation, uh, feel free to write your questions in the chat or bring it up at the end of our panel. So uh, we have a pleasure to share this space with four wonderful professors who will talk about the different ways they have worked and implemented EE in first year large courses. Uh, first, we'll have the opportunity to hear from Dr. Brian or Alvarez, Associate Professor of Teaching and Head of Spanish Studies and the Director of French, Hispanic and Italian Studies Learning Center. Uh, later, we'll hear from Dr. Chen Wang, Associate Professor of Teaching and Director of the Chinese Language Program at Asian Studies, uh, who will be followed by Dr. Catherine Lyon and Dr. Neil Armitage. Okay, can you all see my screen? Yes, okay, wonderful. Um, so thank you so much for the for the introduction, um, and I'm very excited to be part of this panel. Um, I'm going to open up um, the discussion on what EE looks like in a language specific setting. So to, so we'll start with the language and then move into the 
sociology uh, views. Um, and I focused this part on my, my intervention, I guess, on three specific questions. Why do we do experiential education in FHIS, which is the French, Hispanic, and Italian Studies Department? Um, how we do it particularly in Spanish, which is the context that I'll uh, speak to in terms of examples, and then what some of the challenges and solutions are in my spe specific context, which I think align very well to what we've heard already. Um, so why is experiential education important in my department in general? We're a department of uh, Romance languages. So we teach French, Spanish, Italian, and Portuguese, and even Catalan. So we have several language contexts and we have majors and minors in French and Spanish and Italian also has a minor. So we, we are a unique um, major and minor in the sense that a lot of our students will start um, at the basic 101 level in first year Spanish, for example, um, and they've never spoken a word of Spanish, but by fourth year, which are also taught only in Spanish, they have the proficiency level of someone who is potentially a near native speaker. So we get them uh, through all of those layers in a quick four year sequence, which is quite the challenge. So one of the reasons why we do experiential education is precisely to promote student engagement. As you might imagine, a language classroom can be an intimidating space, particularly because everything is happening in a language that is not our own. Um, so experiential education um, helps us work on the knowledge and skills and, and scaffold it throughout our programs from the first year throughout the fourth year. Um, and also the, the work of communication skills which is key to a foreign language and also building community within the classroom and then showing them that um, when we learn another language, there's also this whole community outside of the classroom that we like to engage with. It also works on students' intercultural competence. So when they're, they're thinking about their own cultures through the lens of other cultures, um, and then they're also focusing on empathy, really trying to understand what's happening as they're engaging with other languages and cultures. Um, and then the reflection skills, like um, how did I learn? Why did I learn that way? This really comes through in some of the experiential education that we're doing. So um, similar to what some of the findings that were shared to open up this session, um, our department has several options um, to provide flexible and accessible ways to engage with learning by doing from the first year through the fourth year in the classroom, outside of the classroom. So just to give you an example of the range that we have as a department, um, we do engage in study abroad in global seminars, which, as Naomi mentioned, are quite costly for students, um, but we have uh, those available for options to do intermediate language courses or even um, more culture or literature centered global seminars that take place in Barcelona, for example, or in Mexico, um, if, if we would like to go there. We also have... Um, Maria Carbonetti in Spanish, who is a, a professor who works quite closely with the communities in Vancouver and abroad, specifically South America, to do community engaged and experiential learning at the third year in Spanish. So really getting involved with some of the communities and, and partnering with institutions, both locally and globally, so that our students are getting a feel for how Spanish is used in the business community or in, in other communities related to some of the things that we're studying inside of the classroom. So community engagement is an option. We also have different course-based options um, in all of the languages that we teach. And I'll be talking more specifically to that example um, in a moment. And um, I'm directing the FHIS Learning Center, which is a tutoring center that is run by and for student volunteers. So all of the students that come through our programs, um, not all of them, many of them, we wish all of them would do it, but many of them who are first year students actually come to our center to practice their skills with a third or fourth year tutor who's actually doing um, this type of uh, community building um, if they're looking to go into teaching or wanting to, to work on tutoring skills in a group or a small group or individual setting. And then we also have work learn placements and we're working on developing a co-op option for our students as well. So we have a breadth of um, opportunities for our students and it looks like we have a clear structure, but we actually don't have a way to document what is happening um, all the time in all of these options. So that's what we're hoping to, to get toward um, as we move through. So I'm gonna share two examples of how I engage in learning by doing in two specific course contexts in Spanish. 
Um, and they're very different contexts. The first one is beginner Spanish 101 and 102. Um, these are multi-section courses with 16 to 20 sections of students. Many of our classes have 55 plus students enrolled and we have one instructor and TA support. So I really love the idea of providing bite-size opportunities to get students involved. I think that's, that's exactly what we're going for in these first year Spanish courses. Students have minimal language skills and they're working on their comfort communicating in a different language. So we've found that it's key to introduce learning by doing in small, low stakes, course assignments that build toward a broader course-based portfolio where they're actually showcasing their journey through learning Spanish. And we even call it um, El Español Cerca de Mí. Um, we've called it Mis Exploraciones. We, we typically use the, sorry, the textbook that, oh my gosh, I'm sorry, the textbook that we're, we're using at the moment um, to introduce a title for your journey through this course. Um, so some examples of assignments that students might do is if we're learning about food, for example, we might teach them um, how to make a traditional dish from Spain or from Mexico and kind of walk them through a lesson, maybe have them share a dish that's close to home for them. Uh, and do it in a video format. And then another part of that same assignment might be to go out to visit uh, a restaurant where we know that food from Hispanic culture is served and Spanish is most likely spoken. The menu might be bilingual and they can try their hand at ordering in Spanish. So it gives them a feel for how things are meaningful for them, how to link Hispanic culture to their own food culture, and then what's happening in Vancouver um, in terms of Hispanic uh, studies and opportunities to engage with the communities. Um, I just taught a class uh, at 10 this morning where we're learning about Argentina and the asado, the, the barbecue culture, and also the tango. And then one of my students actually dances tango. And so um, he invited a partner to come in and actually dance the tango for our students. And then we shared with them how they can go out into the culture and dance tango and learn tango right here in Vancouver. So these are just little ways to get their feet wet in a, in a language course. Um, and the idea then is that at the second year where they're getting more um, involved with the language, that they would actually do a deeper project that maybe engages with the First Nations communities in Canada and also the indigenous communities of, of Latin America and look at what that looks like um, through film, literature, and even right here on campus. Um, so this is an example of what we might do in a language course. And then another opportunity to learn by doing is in a course called SPAN 280 or Spanish 280. Um, and it's part of the Romance Studies program, which is a program that mostly focuses on English-based content courses um, meant to expose students to romance languages and cultures um, in, in a way that invites connecting the different aspects of the romance world and potentially focusing on one area of the romance world. So this particular course focuses on the topic of revolution. And um, we might have seen uh, a week or so ago um, in the news that there was a push to dissolve the National Assembly in Ecuador. And the assembly is a big part of, of voting culture. It's a big part of a governing structure in a Latin American context. And so the assembly is meant to be kind of this community in our classroom where when we're going into the assembly, um, which occurs every Friday, the students are dominating this space. And so the assembly is a student led and a student created and facilitated um, portion of the class, um, sort of like a student led tutorial. And so each week the students sit with the same group and they have one to two facilitators each week that will um, come up with some questions that are related to a topic or readings that we're seeing in class, and then really um, show us their way through the topic in a way that is engaging and fun and connects to the discipline that they bring to the class. Um, because the course is taught in English, I found that we have students enrolled in the course, um, which are probably close to 80 students is what I'm typically working with. Um, we have students from psychology, international relations, political science, even Spanish majors that are interested in taking a course in English to see um, how the readings differ or not from the Spanish counterpart. Um, and so we have students from all across the arts. And so this assignment really asks them to think about um, 
what their disciplinary lens tells us about revolution compared to what we might see in a literary context. Um, so the learning by doing part is that they're actually teaching their peers um, about the material while they're also um, exercising interpersonal and empathy skills and really um, trying to come up with questions that will get their, their classmates involved in, in the 30 minute discussion that they're guiding. Um, they also demonstrate um, online facilitation skills in that they are to come uh, together, all of the facilitators from the week to co-moderate the weekly Canvas discussion where we take outside of the classroom some of the topics that uh, came up in the assembly. Um, this activity also connects outside of the classroom because um, not many students, but at least five um, in the last five years have gone on to create their own student-led seminars at UBC. So I definitely get the feel that when we're giving the students the space to teach each other in the classroom, they then might feel more confident to come up with their own course plan and syllabus and find a way to find the gaps in their discipline and maybe the courses that UBC doesn't offer to create their own pathway for their peers. Um, so these are just a couple of examples of how we're engaging in experiential education in a way that is um, looking beyond the community engagement lens and really thinking about what, how what we do in the classroom invites students to look out into the community. Um, and so I'm ending now with just a quick mention of some of the challenges and potential solutions, which also align with how we opened up today. Um, what I'm finding is that it's difficult to find a, a vision of what experiential education looks like with all of the different options um, available to us and to students, while at the same time respecting some of these challenges at an institutional level that, that were brought out in the first few minutes today. Um, it's, it's been very important to think about the learning outcomes that are involved in an experiential education initiative. Um, and also how we assess learning uh, with students. And I find that the best way to assess learning that brings a personal element is actually to ask the students themselves what they're valuing and, and what they would like us to look at together in terms of their learning process. So metacognition or um, how to talk about how I'm learning and why this is important and how this applies, not just to this course, but others is a very important key to experiential education. And then I think just integrating it in a way that respects um, all of the time and energy and passion um, and workload uh, constraints that this type of education brings. Even uh, in the classroom, it's a lot of um, moving parts that come together. So trying to think of a way to integrate it and also recognize the, the great work that students and faculty are doing is a, is a key challenge, but I think it's also a solution to inviting others to do more. Um, so thank you so much. I will leave it to Chen. Thank you. Um, my name is Chen from Asian Studies, um, and I'm actually presenting on behalf of myself and um, another professor, Xiangning Wang, who is uh, currently on leave. Um, I'm glad we're we're going second after Brie because Brie kind of set the ground for experiential learning in language programs. So we're I'm going to present some other examples from the Chinese language program uh, that may look similar um, or different from the examples that Brie talked about. Um, I'm still, um, there's a mess up with the, uh, with the wording, but I'm still going to present my um, land acknowledgement here in written words, which includes the English, the uh, simplified Chinese, the traditional Chinese, uh, traditional Chinese, simplified Chinese, and the pinyin words, which is messed up. Um, and the reason why I'm presenting this uh, at the beginning is that it's actually related to one of the little uh, bite-sized project that we do on the 200 level, where students are invited to uh, doing their own uh, land acknowledgement in the target language that they're learning Chinese, which is very simple, but we still wanted them to uh, experience doing the land acknowledgement in a different language. Um, so we were tasked to answer or to discuss three questions. Um, uh, how do we do uh, experiential learning? 
why do we do them, and the challenge. So I'm going to group my answers to the discussion of the first two questions kind of together, and then um, lastly conclude with the, um, the challenges. Um, so in the Chinese language program, um, I'm going to introduce examples that uh, from courses not um, not just taught by me, but by by uh, other instructors in the program. In the program, we have um, three parts: the the heritage courses um, on top left, the non heritage cor language courses on the top right, and on the bottom is our um, literature courses. So. On the heritage side, um, we do service learning uh, with project that I'm going to show you in a second. Um, and then from non-heritage side, um, we invite students to learn the language through living their lives, um, experiencing the language that they're learning. And on the um, for the large courses uh, where we have a lot of international students, we engage students in experiential learning by inviting them to help learners of Chinese to um, practice and gain better understanding of their own learning as an international student at, here at UBC. So first, um, my PowerPoint has frozen, so let me give it a second to to um, navigate to the second page. But OK, here we go. Uh, I wanted to first talk about the heritage on the heritage side. We have, an, um, um, for example, we have a business Chinese course where students are applying their business language, culture, and knowledge in a local community service project. Um, how do we do that is by partner uh, with uh, NGOs, um, with I've listed two that we've explored. Um, one is with the uh, classical uh, Chinese garden of Dr. Sun Yixian, and the uh, the second one is actually um, a multi-service agents um, to help uh, people in to um, settle down in Canada. Um, the uh, acronym is uh, Success. Um, as you can see, both are um, NGOs. Um, this is an example and a snapshot of the um, project based on Dr. Sun Yixian's um, classical Chinese, Chinese classical garden. Um, and the students were asked to apply and improve uh, their interpersonal interpretative, um, interpretive and presentational language skills um, and to enhance and broaden their intercultural comprehension through the the, the process. Um, at the same time, they will identify the needs of the NGO, the organization, and try to solve real problems and integrate um, resources and showcase uh, plans and products uh, to their not just their peers, but also the staff members that we invite into our classrooms and other community members. Um, I just wanted to quickly show you one group project. So that's what they've come up with um, as a as a project uh, plan. Lots of pages, uh, and then finally they come up with two videos. As you can see, the screenshot on top and bottom, um, two videos that promotes the uh, the garden. Um, they did two versions to suit different needs. Um, so that's the example of the heritage class, um, the business heritage class. On the non-heritage side, um, as Bri has already mentioned, our goal is actually in a language course is not just to for students to memorize the, the vocabulary and the grammar patterns. Um, we the the foreign language courses at at the uh, university level, level has the responsibility to encourage intercultural understanding and build students' intercultural competence. And in order to do that in in a language class, we um, we purposefully encourage activities or learning opportunities that would encourage intercultural understanding. Um, I'm going, only going to introduce one little example, which is a, a, a class project. So the class project um, um, is viewed on uh, three class um, assignment, little class assignment, where, and then the final one is um, a project. So in this um, assignment or project, students are encouraged to look for Chinese characters, either on campus or on street um, or the signage or artifacts that they can find um, around them. 
uh, they're going to introduce these characters and share them. As people probably are aware of, of uh, the examples of such characters um, in Vancouver is actually, we have lots of them. Um, so here is a very, that's one of the examples that I remember very clearly from my students. So the student took a picture of this place. I don't know if people know this, um, but this is uh, the food court under McDonald's in University Village. Um, it's one of the, the, the um, combo, the, the fast food services. It, it has this character that we're learning, which means family. So the student introduced this character that we're learning uh, with the picture that um, he found with this character. Um, well, he took the picture while he visited the place. And um, another student actually find another example of the same word in another context. The student explained. Um, so that's on the bottom, you see what the students share, right? So explain the, the sound, the meaning, and the context, and the, uh, the personal importance. I, I'm sorry, the, uh, it was cut off uh, without finishing. The student explained that um, he, she always visits um, his friend, um, her friend's uh, family, where she saw this picture, never know, uh, never know what this means. But later on, she found out that in her friend's family, um, their um, zodiac animal are all pigs. So they have five little piglets um, in their family. Um, and that's the character of family uh, with that picture posted on their door. Um, I found that to be very, very useful for students learning. Um, one second. Um, I have some other more other examples. This is a student taking a picture of um, a seasoning taken from their own uh, kitchen and uh, the ointment that they use. And this is a picture taken on UBC campus on student day um, where students um, took a picture of the characters, introduced the characters and explained the significance. Uh, this is the final example where the student are introducing um, a poster that they see on uh, Buchanan walls. Uh, it's a grad school application service. And the student explained, uh, read through the different characters, explained his journey of learning Chinese, relying on this poster. So um, this is not a random poster anymore for the student who is learning Chinese, uh, but actually means a lot. Uh, the student even went on to discuss the uh, uh, some of the the um, sorry the um, the message that he could analyze from the the poster about how. Uh, how competitive it is to apply for grad schools for students and um, yeah. Um, the last example that I'm going to give is for the international students. So we talked we talked about the examples for heritage students and the non heritage students. Um, we have a lot of international students who took Chinese at the 400 level. So they may seem like to be not a first year, but I wanted to say that these students actually uh, majority of them take our 400 level literature courses when they're in their first year or, or uh, second year. Um, for these students, we ask them uh, to help uh, the learners from first, second and third year who are learning Chinese uh, to practice, to be engaged in a weekly Chinese language practice of 15 minutes. Um, through the whole process, the, the international students who are learning uh, who are taking our 400 level literature courses, um, get a sense of fulfillment. Um, they are engaged with the UBC learning community as an active member. Um, I can't emphasize enough, but majority, a lot of the uh, international students from um, Asian find themselves to be in isolation or in their little group. They, they felt that after four years, they're still an outsider of UBC. So this is our opportunity to engage them. And then um, through the process that they actually get a better understanding of their own learning. For example, we talk about course syllabus um, um, for the learners and we show them here is a course syllabus for the learners that you're working with. Um, and through the process, somehow the international students start to read their own course syllabus and understand what 
core syllabus mean for their learning. Um, the, uh, in the year of 2020 and 2021, we had, uh, in the year of 2021, as you can see here, we have over uh, 1,000 uh, volunteers who participated. And uh, what I wanted to emphasize in this experiential learning project is the, the, the training that they have to go through. Um, so they have to go through professional training at the beginning, and they, they have to go through training every week for the, uh, for the practice that they're doing. Um, and they receive um, other organized workshop trainings uh, on professional development. Um, and then here are some examples. Uh, but basically, as you can see from the quote here, the student feels that by involved in the, the um, experience, they, they are more passionate about the work um, and they feel uh, it's, it's a good experience for themselves. And um, not only do we ask them to work, we actually celebrate their achievements um, either, well, usually in person, but during the pandemic, it has to be done on, um, online. So um, I don't think I have like, time to go through my last example, but in addition to the, um, the regular experiential learning um, events, uh, we also extend our fourth year literature courses uh, by engaging students in um, a Lenten Festival poetry event where they come in and share their learning um, and then it was moved to online. Um, and I have a video if we have time, we can talk about that. Um, but so I hope the three examples that I shared um, speak to how we do experiential learning and um, explain why we're doing experiential learning in the Chinese classes. Um, but as for the challenges and barriers, um, I, I think it's, um, very similar to what Bree has mentioned and to, to what the team has found. Um, um, it's the logistic of uh, arranging for um, all of these experiential learning events to happen. For example, for our volunteer project, we spent about uh, 600 student, work learn student hours on the organization of the event itself, um, not counting. So these are all logistic, um, making schedules, um, uh, doing the training and engaging them. And the workload for instructors is huge. Um, and the evaluation, I didn't have time to show you the rubrics, but um, the developing the appropriate evaluation method is, I wanted to say, key. I think that's all for me, um, and I'll be happy to um, get your feedback. Thank you. So uh, my name is Catherine Lyon. I'm a sociologist, um, and I'm going to talk specifically about the ways that I've done experiential education, sort of two different streams of ways that I've done it in Introduction to Sociology. I'm going to focus on, you know, why I did it. And I'm focusing on my individual sort of personal pedagogical motivations, less so at a, a program level. I'm going to give some examples of how I did it. And throughout, I'll talk about some institutional facilitators that enabled me to do this work, um, as well as some challenges. And um, at first, I was going to present one specific um, experiential education opportunity and assessment, but now I've actually shifted to doing um, a high level sort of overview of some different options. So here we go, oh, but I'm happy to elaborate on any of the, the things I present in the Q&A. Okay. So the course that I'm speaking about is Introduction to Sociology. Um, for my sections, it's typically been between 100 and 250 students, uh, depending on the year and the term. Um, and this course focuses on three main themes. And actually, um, Neil Armitage is going to talk about the same course, but in a different way. So I think that'll be really productive. Um, so we focused on social inequality in terms of dimensions and, and axes of um, privilege and oppression, race, gender, class, age, ability. We talk about uh, social institutions like family, economy, work, politics, uh, military. And we talk about social interaction, how people uh, see themselves, how they relate to others, and how they make meaning. And um, so why do I 
why do I incorporate experiential education into my teaching of this first year course? Um, so reflecting on that for this presentation, I came up with four sort of four reasons. And again, they're pretty personal to me. So um, pedagogically, my goal is to equip students when they leave the classroom with a particular tools or set of lenses for interpreting the world around them. And I feel like experiential education lends itself really well to application and critical reflection, um, which ties to, you know, Kolb's cycle of uh, reflective experiential learning, having an experience, you know, thinking about it, um, generalizing from it, uh, extrapolating, going back to the field in this iterative cycle. Um, and pedagogically, research shows that these types of experiences help foster deeper learning where students aren't just memorizing discrete bits of information, but actually making connections and having longer, longer memories about what they're learning. And then epistemologically, in terms of how knowing happens, I try to communicate to students, and this is sort of a disciplinary uh, approach within some areas of sociology, is that knowing doesn't just happen from really abstract bird's eye view places, that knowing is always grounded in time and place and can be partial. And so I feel like having embodied experiences uh, teaches students something about sources of knowledge, that it's not just coming from me uh, as this expert, and it's not just coming from our textbooks and these abstract concepts, but that the community uh, can be a source of knowledge grounded in the particular local settings and histories. And then I think I do experiential education um, to clarify that the experiences students are having in first year, but also just their whole life, are moments for critical reflection. So uh, a lot of the scholars that I follow talk about their daily lives as the as problematic as the entry point for um, coming up with their research questions. I also want to help students situate their own social location in the systems that they're participating in, even the education system. Um, and then, and I'll talk about how one of my um, experiential placements was students actually uh, helping instructors in elementary schools um, and how they were then prompted to reflect on their positioning as students and the power relations in the classroom uh, and so on. And then, of course, within sociology, the journal Teaching Sociology documents so many different benefits of um, experiential education early on in your uh, in your university career, uh, you know, connecting to career, uh, future careers, connecting to um, being able to apply disciplinary concepts and feeling like you wanna take more classes in sociology. Um, and then my last reason is fostering connections. So particularly in first year, students are, um, well, I would say the majority of my students, whether domestic or, or international are new to Vancouver. And the way that our campus is structured, um, some students might actually not leave campus very often or ever. and so just getting students off campus to do something in the community in first year, I think is, is really important. And then uh, because we have students from all over the world, having this common community experience, I, I think helps them build friendships with each other and have these common reference, point reference points to refer to. So how do I actually incorporate experiential education into my first year sociology courses. Um, so everything I'm talking about today is uh, with 100 or more students in introduction to sociology. And I wanna talk about two strands. So field experiences, um, so like field trips and different ways that I've done that um, and community engaged learning and different ways I've done that uh, during and after COVID. Uh, and I, I noticed in designing this, this talk, um, that I automatically was defaulting to how how much work it would take a faculty member to do this. Uh, so I think that says something about my own uh, orientation and experiences. So I'm going to focus a bit on like the structure of setting it up. Uh, so basically, I'm going to present high intensity and low intensity options uh, for the faculty member, for, well, for, also for the students. OK. So the first thing I want to share is that um, a really low 
low stakes, low cost way to do uh, field experiences is to have students uh, complete, um, complete an experience at a location outside of class um, where the faculty member isn't there. So something that's been quite successful is sending students to UBC's multidisciplinary undergraduate research conference. Uh, I've done this in my research methods classes, and I've done this in my first year sociology classes, thinking about uh, you know, how knowledge is constructed. Um, and then I've also had students uh, for our unit on social movements and political mobilization. I've had students brainstorm events that are happening in the community and vote on which ones they'd like to attend. And then in pairs or in teams, they attend the event. Um, and so because I'm not there and it's not pre-scheduled, I have students take a selfie at the event, which I guess maybe is a little, you could say there's like some privacy issues there. Um, and then I have them do a report afterwards. So this is the easiest way that I found to do um, field experiences. Then I've also tried field experiences where I actually go, and these are pre-booked, um, and these are more involved. So uh, one year I was focusing on criminalization and decriminalization of drugs and the social construction of reality and power relations. And so I booked a Vancouver Police Museum walking tour um, and I was team teaching, so the tour had 30 students at a time, so we went, we each took two tours, and it was like on a Saturday, um, and the tour was maybe $15 per student, so we had some funding for this, uh, pre-scheduled, um, and uh, one of the challenges of this was that although we did pre-vet the tour, and we went and did the tour first, uh, it depended on the tour guide, and the tour guide we got presented the material in a way that uh, we wouldn't have done so ourselves. So, um, so just thinking about that. Um, but I, I just found out about Vancouver Detours and they seem like an organization that does um, really collaborative tours where they can customize them to your class. So I'm gonna look into that. Okay, so given the challenges of, you know, paying and scheduling and attending a field experience, um, a few years ago, I started collaborating with uh, Siobhan McPhee from Geography, who's on the project team, to try to come up with field experiences that students could do independently or in pairs on, on their smartphones, like a, a guided walking tour. Um, and so we created with a TLEF um, a walking tour of Vancouver protest events, kind of like uh, Pokemon Go, but for academia, where students, you know, download the tour, they go to downtown Vancouver, and then as they're walking around, the audio is prompted by a GPS, and they hear audio of people talking about the protest events at the locations where they occurred, and then they do an essay afterwards. Uh, this didn't translate very well during COVID when students were all over the world, and the technology changes really quickly. Um, UBC doesn't have built-in support for this technology, and then the annual license was very expensive. So I think this is a great option, but I would recommend like using pre-existing tours that have already been created instead of faculty created tours. Um, I think having students do virtual tours from home on their laptop is a great idea. And I've also played around with students creating tours for other students, so more student generated. Um, so those that's my summary of the field experiences I've tried. And now I want to shift to think about uh, community engaged learning. So I've done this remotely and in person. And I really want to stress uh, that I wouldn't have been able to do this without two of the offices at UBC, the Office of Regional and International Community Engagement and the Center for Community Engaged Learning. The, the two examples I'm going to present are with CSEL, the Center for Community Engaged Learning. Okay, so the first example is during COVID when we switched to emergency remote education. Um, and I had already been working with CSEL for a few years. Um, so we figured out a way for students to still have a community engaged learning experience from home. So the theme I was weaving through the course that year was food justice. And so CSEL, what they do is they have these long standing relationships with community partners. And then based on working with me, um, and other instructors, they match you and help facilitate the relationship. Um, so we teamed up with the Edible Garden Project at the uh, in the North North Vancouver neighborhood house. And um, so students, this is a first year class. So mostly the reciprocity piece of it is that all the students become aware of the organization and are able to sort of speak 
positively about it to other people in the community. Um, so what we did was the first part was the community partner agreed to, to dedicate 30 minutes to coming for a Zoom interview with the class where they gave a short presentation and students asked questions. Um, and then in Teams, students did research and prepared uh, social media artifacts that the Edible Garden Project could share on Instagram and Facebook. And so this is a pretty light version of community engaged learning that's appropriate for first year and doesn't expect really high level student outputs. Um, so it's really important to manage the partner's expectations in terms of the year level. Um, and I also put a selection process in, in place so that only the best assignments that got over a certain grade were actually sent to the community partner. And then uh, part three, students did an individual essay where they researched a food justice issue around the world, wherever they were living, because everyone went home during COVID. Um, and then they presented it, um, not in a traditional essay format, but through the Story Maps uh, free online website. And then students toured each other's Story Maps, kind of like a virtual tour. And that's hyperlinked if we share the PowerPoints later. Okay, almost done. Uh, the last thing I wanna show is in-person community engaged learning. So, the following year, I was emphasizing education as one of the social institutions that we were studying and how education can be linked in with social inequality, inequality, both challenging inequality and um, but also reproducing inequality. Um, and so on that theme, students had the option during reading week of spending three days supporting an instructor at a local elementary school. So they were, um, you know, giving little mini lectures to the students and helping with group work. And um, I made this optional for pedagogical and logistical reasons. It was optional uh, so that the students who went actually really wanted to be there. Um, and logistically, we didn't have enough space for all the students. So 30% of the class ended up going and this turned out to be students who didn't have travel plans, either because they weren't international students, so they weren't going home, um, or because uh, they, I guess maybe they weren't, they, they didn't have the, the money to book travel. So maybe this actually was catered to um, lower SES students. Uh, it's hard to say. But this was also connected by the Center for Community Engaged Learning. So they set up the placements. Um, they met the students in the morning at the school and gave them a little check-in session. Um, and I assessed it with a pre-reflection before, during reading week, and then after as well. And I have the reflection prompts if anyone is interested. So to sum up, um, some of the challenges that I faced were uh, student anxieties about the assessment pieces, uh, they wanted extreme clarity about how they were going to be assessed and what reflective writing or journaling is. A lot of confusion around that. I had students who were trying to give me the right answer that they thought I wanted them to, to put. Um, I had challenges with teaching assistants who weren't familiar with community engaged learning. Um, I had multiple TAs who were grading in, in different ways despite having a rubric. Um, and then challenges for an optional assignment, how you make it fair for the students who don't pick the assignment. On the faculty side, uh, if you have new community partners each year, you're creating new assessments each year and rubrics and, and all of that stuff. You have new meetings each year with all the offices and partners. Um, there's a lack of recognition for the work that you're doing. And then on the student side, uh, I've, made the pro I've made the error of not accounting for the time they spend in the field as part of the work that they've done. And then they feel like there's an imbalance in the workload. Okay, thank you very much. I'll pass it off to Neil. Good afternoon, everybody. Uh, last but not least, uh, some of the ideas that I'll be presenting and some of the things I'll be talking about will kind of overlap with what Catherine said. We both teach uh, first year sociology and the same themes and the same ideas. Uh, linking back to kind of the what we found in the first year or having done kind of extensive EE at third year and thinking how do we prepare students to get to that, to scaffold kind of like first year experiences to the third year. Uh, I've been doing kind of bite-sized activities within my first year classes for a few years now. Uh, prior to becoming a lecturer, I was luckily or kind of had the fortune to work in the Center for Student Involvement and Careers. And through that, I found relationships and connections with campus facilitators. But what do I do? Well, I'm going to concentrate and focus on one activity and assignment, which is alumni interviews. 
So this really is just that students towards the end of term. So I teach large courses, large sections of Social 102. Towards the end of the term, students have been working in groups throughout their discussion groups. So I've got multiple discussion groups, multiple TAs. But towards the end, then they self-form their groups in four and they plan and conduct an interview with an arts alumni regarding the alumni's education and career. And then obviously they go off, they come, they collaborate, they analyze the data, but the group assignment then connects into an individual assignment because then they produce an individual essay using sociological concepts to frame and unpack the alumni's career story. So it's kind of a means of an experiential education to come back towards a traditional assessment type of activity that students are familiar with. So the slides move. Yes. So the big why is similar to what Catherine would say is, I think thinking about my own positionality and coming to how I came to the discipline, I, I wanted to make things relevant and how do things, how do we get kind of sociology out of the textbook and out of the lecture hall to make it into a practice, something that they do in their everyday lives. So, and how do we make cosmetic knowledge relevant to their lives? So these are multiple reasons why I do it, but also then, how do we take them through an academic procedure and the skills that are involved in maybe developing and becoming a sociologist or a social scientist writ large? These types of activities, irrespective of whether becoming a sociologist, a geographer, a political scientist, an economist, or anything else, that is going to help them for their further studies and also beyond in their future careers. I also want students, because it's kind of like a collaborative project, to see the value in that and to see the value in learning by doing, not just as a kind of a, them engaging with the text, but them engaging with each other and learning from each other. So really learning by doing with others. Um, this is also being picked up by, and I must champion my facilitate, facilitate, facilitators, and that's what I'll go to next. So that's why I do it. Let's kind of bring in kind of sociology to life. So on the how, um, obviously I have facilitators and resources. And from 2017, from working in the student, Center for Student Involvement and Careers, I've been collaborating with arts alumni engagement since 2017. And I think the longevity of the project, I've learned many mistakes that I've now long forgotten, thankfully, uh, of how to do experiential education. So what you're seeing here is a very kind of like six, seven years of thinking about this and how to do this and how to develop this and how I've learned from some of my mistakes. And I'll get to those maybe whilst I'm talking. But I'd just like to acknowledge the passion and support of my two colleagues in arts and engagement, Rashad Ali and Christine Lee. Now, their piece is on the back end where they actually allow me to kind of basically match the groups of students with alumni. I have to collect the data. To do this and put students in front of alumni to do the interviews, I created a web which I've basically renewed on multiple occasions. And as a According to the web, I get each student to kind of also attain the TCPS2 core online ethics so that they can go out and actually do interviews. Now, this works as a two way thing because A, it's getting them there to do that straight away at the first year. So, therefore, when it comes to doing experiential education in the second year, third year, if they want to do a research associate position, they have the TCPS2 to go and have already done it. Now, some students come in having already done it from other courses, so they don't need to do it, they just basically present that. But since 2017, now over a thousand students and probably around 400 alumni have participated in this activity. Now, so it keeps on going and every year we kind of go through and we've kind of, we've got the logistics down. Not to say that it's easy, but we've got the logistics down after six or seven years of doing this. Now, when it comes to the whole class, the activity is very much kind of the whole class is to do the activity. And to kind of think around the kind of time burden or time constraints often that are associated with experiential education. I kind of a few years back took a decision to, well, interviews are always allocated to a two week period towards the end of term. So they're working towards this. And then I suspend classes for two weeks and no classes are held during the two week period. And this frees up time for groups to plan, conduct, and analyze interview. And instead, scheduled class time is given over to office hours. So groups, students can drop in, get guidance, and seek support on the whole process. This is something I've only done in the past few years. Prior to that, it was kind of on top of. And I felt that 
the correspondence, the panic, the anxiety that students had to try to squeeze everything in was too much. So with a two week period given for them to conduct the interview when they're matched with an alumni by arts alumni engagement, they have the knowledge that they can use the class time to schedule their interview and also come together because they know that they're not doing something else. It's not outside of class time. They can use class time because they all have that same schedule. Now, obviously some students for unforeseen circumstances sometimes can't participate. And because of the benefits of Zoom, um, the last few years have been able to kind of suggest and uh, students have been able to uh, participate by analyzing pre-recorded interviews. So they don't go out and do actually the physical interview, but they do have an interview to analyze and explore and talk about. Now, when it comes to assessment, um, having had kind of multiple ways of trying to do it and think about it, the first year uh, I did a group essay, never again. I kind of made that mistake the first time and really I started to think about how to make this group into an individual so that they're all kind of fully engaged in the process because they have to have an individual output at the end of it so that they're all kind of contributing. One of the things I've done is also allocate roles within the group, predefined roles, what they do for the actual interview, which also helps and facilitates group collaboration. So a lot is spelled out and a lot has been learning by doing for myself, and learning from my mistakes. But the activity acts similar to a capstone in that it accounts for 25% of the course grade. So students know that this is not just a, whilst it's bite-sized and it's kind of in a, towards the end of term, it has a significant impact and is of value to their grade. So really it has some stake to it. Now to help and kind of facilitate that stake, I say, if you get your matching in time, we match you and you do your TCPS2 as per the deadline prior to the start of the interviews, then you get 100% for all of that. So 5%, they get a greater full 100 for that. So it eases some of the anxiety and it gets them and aids me in the logistics of planning this because I need that information by a certain time to send to Arts Alumni Engagement to start the matching process with the groups and the alumni. And then really the kind of final part of it is assessed through just a traditional essay. But well, the essay then is kind of graded on a, a few criteria, the clarity of expression, the writing, well formulated, use, are they drawing on appropriate knowledge from the course concepts, that they can build an analysis and discussion of the data, but also I grade them even in their individual essays on collaboration. I'll get to that in a second. Now, with large courses, obviously I have multiple TAs. So I've actually taken the kind of a lot of the logistics away from the TAs just to kind of ease the logistics and not make it too much of a pyramid structure and just cut them out and really get them to focus in on the grading. Now, also, our TAs in sociology tend to be undergraduates. So towards the end of term, two weeks off from discussion, they're quite happy about this as well. They get time to also dedicate to their courses and thinking about what they're doing and knowing that they get a break. So it's also creating time and energy for them that they can take that they have to dedicate to other courses. But obviously to get consistency, I generally run a TA workshop with students looking through essays. Now, when it comes to the individual essays, analysis and discussion, whilst they're encouraged to come together, discuss and think through what they could apply, they're still encouraged to develop their own and reflect on how their own positionality shapes their analysis insight. So how does their position in the interview shape what they actually think is relevant? So they don't have to discuss the whole kind of data from the interview, but focus in on certain aspects, which talks to them and allows them to use sociology and the sociological pieces that I've talked to them. Now, when it comes to collaboration, what I get to do or what I've instructed the TAs to do is to grade all the same essays from the same group on the same alumni. Students just do one interview in one group. And therefore for collaboration, I get my TAs just to check that the factual information, the time when they went to, they graduated, the, the degrees they took, the majors they took, the careers they chose, that there's kind of like a, the factual information aligns across them. And by that, I know that they've come together, they've discussed and organized themselves and are talking coherently. And then they can take their analysis and discussion in which way they would like to. Now, in terms of reflection and I sometimes have felt, and from my feedback from uh, Arts and Life Engagement, that the reflection actually comes a lot later. And sometimes it's hard sometimes to get them to reflect in the moment. I do, and have in the past asked students through a survey two weeks, three weeks later, at the end of, at the, end of the course, to reflect through a survey. 
And some of the feedback I've got has tended to be very kind of encouraging um, and, yeah, supportive of the activity. So obviously some students talk about the actual learning of how they use concepts and actually make it something that actually makes it important. So learning about the strength of weak ties is something I've heard talk about, but networking in this assignment gave context as to why it's important. So bringing things to life. Also kind of thinking around how they can use their time at UBC to take the opportunities that are there for them. We should look around what is available to us so we can make our own path. So the learn from the paths of the alumni through education into work and now they're starting to think oh what did they do when they were at UBC which activities did get involved obviously we can think about who can then get involved or who can get involved but then they can start bringing in their own positionality well I would like to do this but I can't do this and part of their essay and then we also have kind of people thinking increasingly with the alumni the alumni are becoming more of a diverse group and therefore, we are bringing in a lot more diverse alumni to be interviewed. And that gives opportunities for students to actually meet people and become face to face with people that have had the same kind of social positions and some same kind of challenges that they may have faced going through their education. And here it says here, it changed my point of view when it comes to my education and academia because I was able to relate to that person as not Canadian. And it gave me some ideas about my own future and never stopped looking for what might be better. So it kind of very much kind of like knowledge. The actual activity develops skills in research skills that they have to plan and conduct an interview, but also the values and the ideas of what it can facilitate and their attitude towards their education. My challenges every year, I do it. Every year I've got it down. Every year I get stressed out. Every year I'm kind of dreading this kind of moment where I have to kind of receive all these kind of like Excel templates, which I've created perfectly, got it down the system, but it still bombards and students still make mistakes and students still kind of like ask questions. And it's just the 101 questions that students come with that makes it still very stressful and exhausting. And I think since post online instruction and with COVID, that is when I made the decision to actually kind of turn over class time to the actual activity and release some of the time because the, just the burden was becoming too much. And I felt it and I could see it and I could see the exhaustion in students' faces towards the end of term. So for this to work, I made that switch. Similar to what Catherine was saying when it comes to equity and recognition for faculty. I think while the work is recognized and celebrated by campus partners, Arts Alumni Engagement have a great relationship with them and also Arts Corp are very supportive of the activity. Sometimes the workload is not specifically recognized by the department and maybe the faculty in terms of merit and other things and recognition. And people are not aware or it's not valued in some sense. It's the elevation, it needs to be elevated in the sense of this is what actually creating a good student experience. I think in the last year and a half, what I've also found is kind of some growing resistance. I think there's a, I don't know, I have no evidence for this, it's anecdotal, but this kind of greater resistance to student collaboration or group work and a bit of COVID like, which I sometimes think that it's harder and harder to convince students of the benefit of doing this together and actually learning together. And I'm struggling sometimes with kind of having to always justify and give meaning and reason to why they need to do this and that they don't see the intrinsic meaning in it directly. I think a lot of them enjoy it and do it and really reflect on it afterwards, but getting to that stage to actually plunge themselves into this experience sometimes is really difficult. And I appreciate the anxiety that they have around maybe something completely new. Therefore, the instructions that I have are very detailed, are very guided, and I offer myself throughout office hours throughout these two weeks. So all the support is there, but I still feel that there's maybe a growing resistance uh, among the student body to group work, especially when they think the group work will affect their grades. And even though I've tried to kind of make the assignment an individual assignment in the kind of essay, I still have some resistance. And I'm oft, often thinking that some students are waiting for me to release the alternative assignment to see if they're going to bail out of doing the activity and do that instead and try to edge their bets. And in fact, deny themselves of the opportunity to have an experiential education opportunity because of the fear or the fact that they don't see the benefit in collaboration with others. That's it. So, those of you who hung through, thank you. 
Um, we are now willing to take questions, not only to the panelists, uh, but also to the research team, because the research team have done so much great work and they can talk a lot more to the kind of the ideas, the pedagogical benefits of EE. Uh, I think the panelists can talk to the practicalities, but if anyone has any questions, my suggestion would be is to raise your hand or, or mute yourself if you're confident and just ask your question and maybe to who you'd like to ask your question to. Hi, Margalou. Hi, hi, Neil. Hi, everybody. Thank you. I, I, I've been, I have a question, so I'm glad to get the chance to ask it. Um, they, I was really interesting and inspiring, and I've made, I have lots of uh, great ideas. As some of you know, uh, I teach in the Coordinated Arts Program, which is a first-year program, and so we're often thinking about, um, we're working a lot on program-wide um, community engaged learning. And I've heard sort of over the years of working with Cecil and talking to people that like the challenges that were raised at the beginning, like, you know, it's hard to, it's hard or it's not recommended to do um, this kind of work in first year. And I think that the sort of more salient um, argument against it is the reciprocity piece and sort of equipping, how do we equip these, our first year students to uh, reciprocate with various partners. But I'm just wondering if anybody on the panel has, I don't know, any citations or any other items that they've heard. Like, I guess I'm asking for like, almost like the straw man. Like, what is it that that people are are warning us against? Like, it seems like you're doing it, we're doing it, it's happening. Are there other warnings or other articles that you've read that have been uh, warning against some of the pitfalls or um risks uh in doing this in, in first year i'm trying to get my head around that sort of basically so i can refute it <laughs> cool. i have not read anything particularly why one shouldn't do it i think if you're coming from a community engaged learning aspect i think that the pitfalls become relevant and the rest is positive and that's why i would tend to shy away from those types of experiential activities and go more towards the bite size uh, and think that the kind of community engaged learning which I've done in third year or the fourth year I prefer to kind of like I generally do see a scaffolding in the sense of I whilst yeah just to kind of do something else just to kind of expose students to and I probably would not do community engaged learning myself uh, because I even find it difficult in third year and sometimes I don't find students are well enough prepared at the third year to do sometimes those activities. And that's why I do bite size. And it's one of the reasons why I'm doing bite size is to hopefully to get them a bit further along so that when they come to the third and fourth year, like the researchers indicated, scaffolds and prepares them for those activities. So that's my opinion. Yeah, I, sorry. Sorry to jump in. I, I, can you hear me clearly? My headphones not working properly. Yeah, so I, I don't have any research um, to show that people are against this, but my feeling is that a lot of um, instructors, um, not a lot, some of our instructors in our program uh, don't want to do this, uh, not because of the workload, but they are against the idea of um, letting students do experiential learning, especially at the beginning, because they ask for a strong foundation. That's what they use um, in knowledge. Uh, so apparently, to be able to memorize and um, uh, the things, the facts, and put them on a piece of paper are more important um, for some of um, our instructors than for students to, to exp experience the things, um, which I say. They will forget about the things that they put on their exam paper um, two months after. But if we ask them to chat with a native speaker, they will never forget that experience. I guarantee you for at least 10 years. Thank you. Yeah, that, sorry, Brie, go ahead. I was gonna say that that is a concrete one. That, yeah, that sense of like, no, they need the foundation first. So, okay, I will, I got that, Brie. <laughs> Yeah, I was just going to say, um, I think the because community engagement tends to be the the sort of star among the experiential options that are available. I think um, the workload alone and just finding the partners, having sustainable practices, recognizing the work, 
um, that goes into it. And even the just the logistical things that happen when you're running a class and that has a curriculum. In our case, most of the experiential learning in the form of community engagement takes place in courses that are required for our majors and minors so that they get that experience. But at the same time, not everybody wants to do it from the student perspective either. So if that's the only option they have, I find, you know, sometimes the students are like, but I, I don't want to do that, you know. Um, so I think what really helped me understand um, was actually sitting down and thinking about all of the things that we're doing. And um, we had a meeting recently where I was sort of walking our, our faculty through like all the things that we're already doing. And there was this sort of misconception that you can't do experiential learning in a literature course. And then I was like, yeah, but you're doing podcasts and you do videos and blogging and like, how not this a little bit of learning by doing? So I think just building a definition that works for each unit is really the key so that our students and faculty understand from our disciplinary lens um, in our institutional capacity, what this looks like and what the potential is. And then that that sort of steers them like it's kind of like, oh, well, I am doing this. And then it's like a, a point of pride, which is really cute and fun. So anyway, that's that's kind of what I think. Thanks. I don't I, I will shut up. I don't need to hog every, all the discussion, but I, I think you raise a point there about I think often in first year courses, we have students who aren't necessarily buying in yet. To, you know, like it's not as much of a selective group. Certainly that's the case in our program. So that's why, but I heard a lot of you had like options or, you know, you, you, you it's not required, some of those things. So anyway, that's another good one. So thank you. Thanks everybody. Uh, Shan, I'd just like to ask you, how do you, you know, I mean, obviously you talked quite a lot about the different things you do between heritage, non-heritage. How do you, do you have any looping effect of how you use kind of like fourth years, third years to kind of, you did mention that obviously a lot of people, whilst they take a 400 class, they are first years. Um, is there anything kind of specifically by size that you do for first years? Yeah, so the uh, the for the non heritage, everything that I mentioned is for specific for 100 uh, first year students. Um, and the when I said the 400 helping first year and second year, the court I wanted to emphasize again that it, the course code is 400. But we checked our uh, student enrollment. We actually have a lot of first year students taking that course. And we'd like to think our 400 level literature courses as an entry course for international students to get familiar with UBC learning community. Um, so we do things like going through the course syllabus really carefully to help them understand this. Um, and we ask them to, um, we emphasize on uh, things like what does plagiarism mean, how to find resources, those really entry level UBC student um, tools, um, we would teach them at the 400 level. And then students gave us the feedback of, you know, when they when they went on to take a history class or a sociology class course, they actually understand the course syllabus better and they know how to do their writing without um, stepping into the dangerous field of uh, plagiarism. So, yeah, I hope that kind of answers your questions. Okay, thank you very much. Unless uh, anyone has got any final comments. Cheers, guys. Thank you for coming. Thank you. Thank All you. The best.